Okay, hi there. Welcome to a video on development economics. Let's spend a few minutes thinking about uh, some policies that might help to bring down the level of relative poverty in low and middle income countries. A quick reminder about the definition of relative poverty. It's defined as when household income is considerably below the median income within a country. Notice here we're using the median income as our key benchmark for relative poverty. And the relative poverty line in most countries is uh, when household income or disposable income, if we adjust for taxes and benefits, is less than 60% of a country's median income. I think one of the key things to be aware of as we head into 2022 in exams is that the COVID pandemic has increased inequality in many countries, both within and also between countries. One considers, for example, the, the, the huge inequity in syringe and vaccine availability and deployment, particularly between high-income nations and low-income countries. Uh, the pandemic has severely hit access to affordable education and healthcare in many countries, which obviously affects uh, human development. Uh, the scale of job and income losses has, uh, has been uh, very large in many countries, and so too the volatility of prices and incomes for countries dependent on commodity exports. And many low-income countries, of course, heavily dependent on tourism, and travel for their economies, they've lost income as the global tourist sector has been hit. So here's a quick think about a question such as this one. What policies might be effective in reducing relative poverty in developing emerging countries? Well, relative poverty occurs when people have income significantly below the, the, the median income for their society. And policies designed to reduce inequality is often influenced by a desire uh, to achieve uh, horizontal and vertical equity. In other words, to give people fundamentally uh, increased opportunities within their economies. There's a, there's a kind of list of half a dozen potential policies, including minimum wages, which we're going to focus on in this video. Introduce a minimum wage in the formal labour market. Direct provision by the state of key public and merit goods. Perhaps government subsidies might be used to bring down the cost of basic essentials such as food and fuel. Uh, perhaps you need to reform your tax system to make it more progressive. Or generate, uh, explore and build a means-tested basic welfare system. Means-testing, of course, is when you allocate benefits according to financial need. And, and policies to reduce relative poverty must, at their heart, uh, be successful in bringing down unemployment, and creating more jobs, better paid jobs, in poor areas. Now, for example, if you're thinking about your revision, if you get a question on po policies to reduce relative poverty, with a minimum wage, can you draw an analysis diagram? We'll look at an example in a second. If, you, if you're talking about the direct state provision of key public and merit goods, can you give specific examples? Public goods, improved law and order, for example, uh, in better infrastructure, uh, merit goods, education and healthcare, for example. Government subsidies, again, can you visualise in your mind and draw an analysis diagram to show the effect of a subsidy? With a tax system making it more progressive, that involves increasing both the marginal and the average rate of tax as income goes up. So which, which countries have done that? Which countries have chosen that pathway? And again, policies to reduce unemployment. Which policies? What, which policies do you think would be most effective in bringing down unemployment and helping people generate higher incomes? And why? Which policies do you think are most effective? And why is that the case? I think really key in the exam is to build your analysis using chains of reasoning. Examiners are looking for you to complete a chain of analysis to illustrate a cause and its effect. So here we go. Let's look at an example. A minimum wage, in theory, can lead to a reduced Gini coefficient and therefore a drop in relative poverty. What a lot of students do is they tend to miss out one or two links in the chain of analytical reasoning. And you can drop marks uh, very easily attainable as a result. So build a little bit more detail into your reasoning. A minimum wage is a statutory pay floor in the labour market. Employers cannot legally pay below it. And as a result, if you introduce a minimum wage, uh, monopsony employers, for example employers that are big buyers of labour in a town or a city, uh, they may now have to pay higher wages than without this intervention. And uh, this means that hourly wages of low-income households will increase, leading to higher total pay, 
for those low-income households, which can then lead to reduced Gini coefficient and therefore a drop in relative poverty. Example coming up here, try to build chains of reasoning into your analysis. You'll get significantly higher marks because good analysis built first uh, leads to strong evaluation. So try to work on those chains of analytical reasoning to reach the highest knowledge analysis and application marks. So let's look at this question, evaluate the effectiveness of a higher minimum wage in reducing relative poverty in low income countries. Well, in fact, in some countries, there is a monthly minimum wage. This, this is data for 2021 from a selection of Latin American countries. Notice here the data is monthly wage, not hourly wage. That's slightly important. And also it's in US dollars. Uh, and of course, uh, it looks on the surface that Ecuador and Chile and Panama have much higher minimum wages than in countries such as Brazil and Argentina, which may well be true. But one a thought here is that this data is not necessarily adjusted for purchasing power parity. Now one has to ask how much, for example, in Brazil will $214 go in terms of buying goods and services uh, compared, for example, to, to Chile, which is a, a higher income advanced country where the minimum wage is nearly double. So sometimes look to see how the data is presented. Also, this monthly minimum wage uh, for each country, yes, there's a big gap, uh, but it might have been presented as a percentage of the monthly median wage in, in each country to give a better idea of the generosity of the minimum wage. Let's build through the analysis. So a minimum wage, I think if you, if you were to um, uh, get this question, most students, I think, would be thinking about talking about a, a minimum wage. So clearly a good chance for a diagram. Here's a, a labour market diagram with labour supply, labour demand and uh, an equilibrium, initial equilibrium wage of W1 with E1 number of people employed. And of course, you'll know, hopefully, that to have any effect on the labour market, a minimum wage, a pay floor, must be set above the existing, if you like, competitive wage rate. So I've put it uh, tidily up above there, minimum wage rate and the dotted line. Now, this has several consequences. First of all, other things being the same, if employers have to pay a higher minimum wage, it's likely that they may cut back on employment. So employment may move from E1 to E2, move up the labour demand curve. But of course, at higher wages, more people are looking actively to find work. So the labour supply might expand from E1 to E3. And that can create, if you like, some excess labour supply or unemployment. Our focus here really is whether a minimum wage uh, helps to reduce the relative poverty among low-income households. So let me just throw a few letters in there, A, B, C, D. Uh, my interest here is just to develop this diagram a little bit. So instead of just, I'll go back a slide here, instead of just showing the diagram, showing a minimum wage, just develop it a little bit more to show the total income that goes to people at the two wages, W1 and the minimum wage. So the total wage income uh, before the minimum wage is wage times employment, which is equal to O W one D E one. That will be the total wage income before the minimum wage. Well, afterwards, people are getting paid more, but there are fewer people in work. So the total wage income after the minimum wage is O A B E two. Now, to my untrained eye. We lose the area C, D, E1, E2 because there are fewer people in work, but we gain the area A, B, C, W1. And I think that second area is bigger. So in this situation, because labour demand is relatively wage inelastic, uh, the total wage income has gone up, hinting at, supporting the idea that a minimum wage might, might help to reduce relative poverty amongst low-income families. Uh, there's a bit of analysis. Let's just build some evaluation. So to what extent is a higher minimum wage an effective policy to reduce relative poverty? Well, in part, it depends on how high the minimum wage is set. In particular, if the minimum wage is set high relative to the median wage. So example of Brazil, uh, who knows, whatever, $214, wasn't that a thing? How high is that relative to Brazil's median wage? The more generous the minimum wage is, the more likely it will be effective, 
But of course, the higher the minimum wage, the greater the risk of lost jobs. A second point is quite good context here, that the minimum wage is nearly always only applied to workers operating, if you like, in the formal labour market with recognised employers. And often, as you know, in many low-income countries, many emerging market countries, the informal labour market is very high. I found a bit of data which showed that 60% of the Colombian economy is defined as informal. And there's no guarantee that a minimum wage would uh, directly affect those workers. There might be some indirect effects, but keep that thought in mind. Uh, how many people would the minimum wage impact? Poss possibly relatively few. And secondly, ask the question, or thirdly, third point, ask the question, to whom does the minimum wage go? Does it go to people on their own in a family, in work, or is it actually a minimum wage income to a second or a third family worker, um, to a family that probably isn't necessarily that poor in the context of their economy. So if the minimum wage goes to secondary family workers, then it's going to be less likely to be effective in reducing relative poverty because those families might already have a household income um, that's close to the median. Another issue you might want to raise as part of your evaluation is that a minimum wage might, might influence the net flow of a foreign direct investment. So if Mexico, for example, increases their minimum wage substantially, that might, might affect the cost competitiveness of Mexico as a, as a venue for manufacturing industries. Uh, that's always something to bear in mind because that's obviously going to affect costs. One of my students made this point, the next one, I sort of added it to the slide, that if you increase the minimum wage, there's a risk of possibly demand pull, but also cost push inflation. And therefore, if inflation goes up, the, the rising cost of living might have a regressive effect on the low-income families. Oftentimes, for example, food and fuel prices go up and low-income families get hit disproportionately. So higher inflation might reduce the real value benefit of a higher minimum wage. And I suppose the last point in evaluation is that a minimum wage on its own as a policy is often simply just not enough. You need a combination of policies to help meet basic household needs. 25 million people in Mexico, uh, amongst the very poor in Mexico, they lack basic housing services. So yes, a minimum wage might help, but fundamentally that's about, uh, it's about government providing key public uh, merit goods, better housing, better education, better health care, not always affected directly by minimum wage. A recent uh, research uh, published in World Development in the spring of 2021, um, research engaged by Orlando Sotomayor, argued that there is some evidence that a minimum wage can reduce poverty and inequality in the developing world. And uh, Sotomayor's research focused on Brazil. I've just picked out there the, the, the core arguments that the elasticity of changes in the incidence of poverty with respect to changes in the minimum wage is approximately minus 0.1. It's minus, suggesting that a higher minimum wage can reduce poverty. But 0.1 suggests a fairly low elasticity. If you raise the minimum wage by, let's say, uh, 20%, you might only bring down the incidence of poverty by 0.1 of that, 2%. So minimum wage on its own can work but may not necessarily be very effective, suggesting you need a range of policies if you want to tackle the, the root causes of relative poverty in low-income countries. So there we go. Hopefully that was a useful little journey through some policy issues, building analysis, building evaluation, and adding in a little bit of context along the way. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Be, stay curious. And see you again sometime soon.